It strikes with terrifying speed, a bacterial disease that can kill within hours. And the victims are all children and teenagers. In Alberta, Canada, scientists must try to identify the infection and find the cause of the outbreak before it can turn into an epidemic. With more and more lives on the line, they'll have to take drastic measures before it's too late. Christmas 1999 passed quietly for most residents in Edmonton, Canada. But for one family, the holiday season was about to become a nightmare. The day after Christmas, 18-year-old Matthew Boulding woke up with a stiff neck and a fever. His mother knew her son had been working hard in his first semester at college. She assumed he had the flu until she saw his arms. They were covered with strange splotches, like dark purple bruises. Carol Boulding had no idea what she was looking at. But she knew there was something terribly wrong with her son. As Matthew was rushed to the hospital, paramedics worked to stabilize him. I was very, very scared that we were losing Matthew. Um, it was, um, it was a really very scary time. At the University of Alberta Hospital, Matthew was hurried into the emergency room. By the time they reached the ER, his mother was becoming more and more worried. She headed straight for the admitting nurse. She felt there was no time to waste. I was going over to her and, and saying, every second counts, every minute counts, and, and we really, you've got to do something. Dr. Michael Bullard responded quickly. As he examined the day's teenager, Dr. Bullard knew that Matthew's body aches and stiff neck could be symptomatic of dozens of different illnesses. As an emergency physician, our training is such that we're taught to think of the most dangerous and uh, most lethal uh, diagnosis that could present in this manner first. Okay. So this is quite a purplish rash. Uh, when did it start? Did you see it just this morning? Or? Just this morning. Oddest and most troubling, the purple splotches on Matthew's hands. So it's been and now the mysterious rash was spreading to his legs and feet. Known as petechiae, they are caused by broken blood vessels under the skin. We need to get some blood tests done. Dr. Bullard couldn't be sure, but he had a suspicion what these spots might mean. The boy had a dangerous form of bacterial meningitis. The usual initial symptoms are just um, sore throat, headache, muscle aches, and low-grade fevers, and sometimes a little bit of diarrhea. But this can either quickly or gradually progress into a much more serious form of infection. Meningitis is a condition that inflames the lining of the spine and the brain. And have you had a but in its most severe form, called meningococcemia, something worse happens. It triggers a so-called inflammatory cascade, a runaway reaction of the immune system and widespread organ failure. Left untreated, it is one of the few diseases that can kill within hours. When we see anybody with a dangerous infection that we think is bacterial, the current standard of 
care is to start antibiotics as soon as things like blood cultures and urine cultures are drawn. Just wait here for a second. Denise. Sorry, can you help uh, in here? I think he's got uh, meningococcus. Dr. Bullard ordered intravenous antibiotics. If Matthew was suffering from meningitis, he couldn't wait 24 hours for test results. In 24 hours, it could be too late. Meningitis can be highly contagious passed by a cough or a sneeze, or any contact with droplets from the nose and throat of an infected person. Until the diagnosis was certain, Matthew needed to be kept away from other patients. Even those treating him needed to wear protective clothing. Drawing blood and spinal fluid samples, the nurse sent the specimens to the laboratory. At the University of Alberta's state-of-the-art hospital lab, Dr. Greg Turrell, a clinical microbiologist, received samples of Matthew's blood for testing. When the blood culture arrives in the laboratory, uh, it still has to be incubated to allow the organism to grow. And this may take anywhere from 18 to 20 hours. Once the blood is incubated, scientists can determine if the specimens contain any foreign organisms. What they're looking for is carbon dioxide, a byproduct of growing bacteria. Blood is loaded into a, a blood culture vial and it's loaded onto a machine. The, the vials themselves have detectors loaded on the bottom of the bottle. And as the bacteria grow in this very nutritious environment, they release CO2. In Matthew's case, there was no doubt. Sensors indicated an increased level of carbon dioxide. Matthew's blood was testing positive for bacteria. The only question was exactly what type. Bacteria have distinct cell shapes. Even after the cells are dead and no longer infectious, microbiologists can determine the cell shape and identify the bacteria. When the sample is mixed with a colored solution, the shape of the cell emerges. A kind of fingerprint, revealing the precise type of bacteria. The verdict from the lab was swift and shocking. Matthew had been infected by a particularly virulent and deadly form of bacterial meningitis. It triggers an infection that can cause blood clots in the arms, legs, and brain, leading to coma and shock. Without blood, tissue in the arms and legs dies. Doctors can be forced to amputate. And in 10 to 15% of the cases, it results in death. For Dr. Bullard, it was difficult to give Matthew's parents and sister such a grim diagnosis. Matthew has an infection that uh, we think is caused by a bacteria called meningococcemia. And Their son had been perfectly healthy just days before. Now, he was fighting for his life. A stunned Carol Bolding coped the only way she knew how. She began to educate herself on Matthew's condition. Well, I would ask what are his blood platelets at, and what's average, what's low, what's normal. And I felt like I knew a little bit more because it's that not knowing that, that is, is frightening when you're in hospital. So I felt a little bit more in control that way. Carol soon learned that Matthew was being given massive amounts of antibiotics. But there was no guarantee they would work.
we wouldn't expect to see much in the way of improvement for at least 24 to 48 hours because usually it takes some time for the antibiotic to first get into the system and to reach a therapeutic uh, dose range and then to actually allow the body to start to recover. All Matthew's doctors and family could do was watch his condition and wait. When your child is ill, you have to deal with whatever you have to deal with. But I don't think you really uh, breathe again until they tell you you can. Matthew's doctors contacted Dr. Jerry Preddy of the Capital Health Authority. Meningitis is infectious and can quickly spread out of control in a community. Health officials track every case Matthews was actually the second instance of meningitis reported in Edmonton that December. While it was of some concern to have two cases in a week, it was not, not, nothing that we thought was particularly out of the ordinary. As a precaution, Dr. Preddy asked his staff to issue a warning to area hospitals and clinics. Every doctor in the area needed to be on the lookout for cases of meningitis. The disease is most prevalent in the winter. The cold, dry weather makes people more susceptible, especially children and teenagers. When your mucous membranes, the linings of your nose and throat get dry, they, they do tend to be, uh, it tends to be easier for various uh, germs, including this one, to, to get into the uh, lining and, and then uh, cause infections. The doctors were closely tracking Matthew's progress. Within two days, the antibiotics had started to kick in. Slowly but steadily, Matthew was starting to recover. But the doctors couldn't figure out where this virulent meningitis had come from. They needed a list of everyone family and friends he had come in contact with before he began showing symptoms. It is transmitted through people who cough or sneeze, uh, little droplets form, and it is, can be transmitted to someone else that way, or through uh, saliva if people, uh, for example, share a cigarette or share a drink, then, then they can get it that way. Doctors examined Matthew's family and his girlfriend. No one showed signs of the disease. Health officials were baffled how Matthew contracted the disease and if anyone else was infected. They could only hope they had seen the last meningitis case of the season. But in a city near Edmonton, another teenager had started to feel ill. 17-year-old Ryan Zelke was a popular high school senior. He played lead guitar in a garage band. On January 7th, a week after Matthew Bolding became sick, Ryan experienced a severe asthma attack. He had had asthma problems for most of his life. When Ryan's mother took him to the doctor, he was diagnosed with the flu. His parents kept a close watch on his condition. But he became weaker, developing severe aches and pains. He was too weak to walk to the bathroom on his own. Then Michelle Zelke saw the splotches on her son's chest. She didn't know what caused them, but this much was certain. 
her son was in trouble. They had to get Ryan to the hospital. There was no time to wait for an ambulance. The car would be faster. On the way, Ryan told his mother that his chest was starting to tighten. He was having difficulty breathing. Michelle could feel his heartbeat weakening as she tried to find a pulse. In the ER, the doctors were alarmed. Ryan's pulse was erratic. His blood pressure was plummeting. He had fallen unconscious. And then he started to flatline. Ryan was crashing. The ER staff worked frantically to revive him. Okay, clear. Michelle Zelke went to be with her husband. Their son was in trouble, and there was nothing they could do. For over an hour, the medical team tried to resuscitate the boy. But in the end, he couldn't be saved. On January 10th, 17-year-old Ryan Zelke was pronounced dead. And he would not be the last victim of meningitis in Edmonton that winter. The outbreak was just beginning. In January of 2000, a 17-year-old boy came down with flu symptoms. 48 hours later, he was dead. Doctors suspected his death was caused by a dangerous strain of bacteria. Medical examiners performed an autopsy, looking for clues to confirm the diagnosis. Because the bacteria in his blood was still infectious, they wore protective clothing. They had to figure out exactly what had happened to the young man, why the disease had hit him so hard, so rapidly. The bacterial infection had damaged his blood vessels, leading to shock and complete organ failure. At the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton, technicians examined Ryan's blood and tissue samples, looking for clues. Initial tests confirmed that he had bacterial meningitis. Doctors forwarded the lab and autopsy results to the health authority. Officials feared this might be the start of an outbreak. Ryan was the third case in less than a month. Medical officer of health, Dr. Jerry Preddy, feared the worst. In this case, even when our number of cases was, was not anywhere near what people would consider an outbreak situation, it was our gut feeling that there was something unusual happening. Following Ryan's tragic death, the Edmonton news media got a warning out to the public. The group most at risk? Teenagers. There are probably a number of reasons why uh, teenagers and young adults are more at risk, but it's the behavior issues, the behavioral types of behaviors that they engage in uh, that put them at risk. More than any other age group, teenagers tend to gather in large numbers. Day or night, in classrooms or parties, they are jammed together, sharing sodas, cigarettes, or affection. In each of these exchanges, the bacteria can spread from one person to another. But the puzzle for investigators was that none of the meningitis patients had attended the same school. 
they still didn't know where the outbreak originated. On the hunt for clues, investigators questioned Ryan Zelke's parents. Thanks for seeing us. There was one starting point. All three victims lived within the Edmonton area. Investigators wondered if the victims knew one another or had attended the same party or come in contact at any type of gathering. But Ryan's parents weren't certain of any specific social events their son had recently been to. Looking for links, investigators also questioned Matthew Boulding, hoping to find out where and when he might have encountered the other two victims. But there were no easy answers. All three patients had never met. The trail would be even harder to find. The issue in tracking the source of infection is that most people who have the organism don't have any symptoms. So most of the people who acquire the illness uh, likely acquire it from an asymptomatic individual. All over Edmonton, public health nurses try to get the word out warning teenagers to go to a doctor immediately if they experienced flu-like symptoms, followed by a telltale purple rash. But the lethal bacterium was on the move, and it couldn't be stopped. The outbreak was now entering a more dangerous, more baffling phase, targeting even younger victims. Days after Michelle Zelke lost her son to meningitis, another worried mother sat in the emergency room at the University of Alberta Hospital. Four-year-old Alex Hansen seemed to have a bad case of the flu. My husband had the flu the week before, so I just assumed that he had caught the flu from my husband because he had, you know, the same symptoms, not wanting to eat, a little bit tired. But as they waited to see a doctor, Alex fell unconscious in his mother's arms. Doctors rushed the boy into the treatment bay to begin emergency procedures. As Alex's mother helped them remove his shirt, they all noticed the dark purple splotches on his chest. They lied him down on the bed, and within one minute, they're putting masks on and gloves on and telling me to, you know, to just to back away. The ER staff gave him oxygen and intravenous fluids, trying to stabilize the boy. But Alex's blood pressure was plummeting. The nurse hurried Cheryl out of the room. And the nurse said, you know, we're not sure what's going on, but, you know, just let them work. If you need to call anybody, call them now. And I thought, well, he's got the flu. What are you doing? You know, I, I couldn't understand it. The little boy was now in critical condition. As they transferred him to pediatric intensive care, they knew his state was precarious. And then the nurse brought me to him because he had woken up a little bit. And he looked me right in the eye and said, Mommy, I feel better now. I thought, okay, you know, then obviously maybe he was just dehydrated or something. And that's when the nurse said, no, we're going to be knocking him out now and paralyzing him so we can put the catheter and everything in. Alex's long-term prognosis was uncertain. The doctor gave Alex's parents all the information he could. He feared their son had contracted bacterial meningitis. It would take the lab 24 hours to confirm the diagnosis. And the pediatric doctor told us that he only had about a 50% chance of survival at that point, and that the next 24 hours were going to be critical. And as he's telling us this, the nurse ran in and told us that his blood pressure was dropping again. So he took off out, and my husband and I were sitting there, and we didn't, we didn't know what to do or, or anything. And he came back and he said, okay, he's stable again, but this is the way it's going to be for the next 24 hours. 
and I, I didn't know how I was going to get through it. I, I honestly didn't. It was horrible. It was heartbreaking for the Hansons to see their little boy hooked to tubes and machines. Massive quantities of intravenous antibiotics were being pumped into his tiny body. He needed a respirator to breathe. He had tubes all over the place, needles all over the place. And he had the purpley black spots all over his body. And I couldn't believe that this had happened within an hour of me seeing him. Because it, it was, it was no more than an hour that I had seen him from the emergency room to when he was in the ICU. The bacteria was coursing through Alex's bloodstream. If his mother hadn't brought him to the emergency room early on, he would have died. The doctor warned the Hansons that if Alex survived, he might suffer neurological damage. I, I, start, I broke down, so the nurse took me out of the room and said, you can't do that in case he can hear you. You have to be strong in front of him. And for about the next three hours, I don't really remember who I talked to or what I did or anything. I, I think I was more in shock than anything. The next day, in the hospital lab, Dr. Turrell verified that Alex had bacterial meningitis. It was the fourth confirmed case in less than a month. The same number they might expect to see in an entire year. The city of Edmonton was facing a killer bacteria. And the epidemic was about to erupt. In Canada, public health officials were confronting a deadly outbreak. A lethal form of bacterial meningitis had taken the life of one teenager. And health officials still didn't know the source of the bacteria. A lady from the health department talked to me and told me how contagious this was and asked me the names of all the kids that Alex had been in contact with in the past week. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, he's been in contact with so many people, I, I can't even start. Health officials visited daycare centers all over Edmonton. They distributed a warning to teachers and parents. A bacteria was on the loose their children were at risk. Two days after four-year-old Alex Hansen had collapsed in the emergency room, he was still in critical condition. And now, his mother faced a new fear. Doctors were worried Alex had suffered brain damage from his bout with the bacteria To find out, electrodes were attached to the child's head to record brain activity. Alex's brain had not been damaged by the infection. Now all he had to do was survive. Over the next few days, scores of patients with flu-like symptoms appeared in Edmonton emergency rooms as worried parents brought in all sorts of sick children. Many patients with upper respiratory infections came in concerned that they had contracted the disease and wanting reassurance that in fact they did not. While many did not have the disease, health authority investigators realized that the confirmed cases of meningitis were rising rapidly. In the middle of January, we had a over a period of less than a week, uh, five cases, including a 20-year-old, a seven-year-old, a couple of four-year-olds, and, and, and an infant. The bacteria had struck eight victims in under a month. The danger was escalating, and investigators had no link. 
no common thread among the patients. Health officials were now facing an outbreak of fatal meningitis, and they needed to find out how it was continuing to infect the population. Because there were no links and because these cases occurred over a fairly short period of time, it just started to create in our minds uh, the idea that perhaps uh, there might be something unusual as far as the circulation of this particular bacteria in the community. At the University of Alberta Hospital, Dr. Greg Turrell tried to pry clues from the bacteria itself. Tyrrell suspected one of two possibilities. Either the bacteria was a new strain, never before seen in Edmonton, or an existing strain that had mutated, becoming more virulent. Up to 5% of the population can carry the basic meningitis bacteria. But if Edmonton was dealing with a new or mutated meningitis strain, this would explain why so many people were getting sick. The population had not yet developed any immunity. Dr. Turrell analyzed the bacteria's DNA. What he found was startling. All eight patients were infected with exactly the same strain. And it wasn't like anything he had seen before. Just like the flu, he suspected the meningitis bacteria had begun to mutate. Now that the lab had identified the bacteria, health officials had a chance of containing the outbreak. A vaccine was available for this type of meningitis, but they had to get it to enough people before they came down with the disease. Dr. Jerry Preddy proposed a massive vaccination program to provincial health officials. At that point is when we really initiated discussions with the Ministry of Health about if and when we would need to uh, do an immunization campaign. We really started to get concerned. Vaccination programs are expensive and difficult to implement. Dr. Karen Grimsrud of the Provincial Health Authority faced a difficult decision. Looking at all that information then, Canadian guidelines that look at if you have 10 cases in a certain age group, this 15 to 19 year olds per 100,000 population, so over a three month period, then you should start considering having a vaccine program. With just under 10 cases, health officials held off, waiting anxiously. And then, a case that would change everything. On February 4, 2000, Doug McAngus brought his 16-year-old daughter Dawn to a suburban clinic. She had started feeling sick the day before. Dawn had the chills and a fever. She had been vomiting. I didn't realize what was happening. I knew she was really sick, but I'm thinking, you know, I don't know, maybe she got food poisoning or something. She was so violently throwing up so much. After a routine examination, the doctor concluded that Dawn had a normal case of the flu. The family was told the virus would run its course in a couple of days. It was an easy case to misdiagnose. That night, they tended to their daughter. She was lying on the couch. We just kept changing her cloth and everything all night. Around 4.30 a.m., Doug and Deidre were awakened by a loud thud. Dawn had collapsed on her way to the bathroom. Oh, darling, you're feeling a lot better. 
In the dim light, Deidre spotted something that took her breath away. Purple splotches on her daughter's skin. The story of Ryan Zelke flashed into her head. She had seen reports about his case on the news. I noticed she had the five purple spots on her chest. At that time, that's when I knew that my daughter had meningitis. Deidre knew the clock was ticking. Dawn was getting sicker by the hour. There wasn't much time to act before the disease did irreparable damage. In Alberta, Canada, a deadly strain of bacteria threatened the city of Edmonton. Young people were most at risk. One teenager had already died. When Deidre and Doug McAngus spotted the dreaded purple rash on their daughter's chest, they rushed her to the hospital. You knew that it was serious because they didn't even ask me to do the paperwork, first of all. They just took care of Dawn right off the bat. The ER doctor immediately suspected bacterial meningitis. He gave her antibiotics right away. There was just a short window to intervene, to kill the bacteria before it was too late. Already, the 16-year-old girl was in agony. She said, Mom, my ankles, my ankles. And uh, she was in a, a lot of pain at that time. The doctors looked at me and they said, Deidre, you have a very sick child. The doctors decided to transfer Dawn to the University of Alberta Hospital, where the staff was better equipped to treat her meningitis. In the ambulance, the paramedics gave her oxygen and a sedative to help ease the pain. By the time the teenager arrived in the hospital's intensive care unit, the bacterial infection had shut down both her kidneys and her lungs. She needed a respirator just to breathe. So they hooked her up to the machine and they were cleaning the blood to see whether we couldn't get Dawn healthy again. They were, you know, it was a matter of six days of having hope and not having hope and it was just being on a roller coaster. For nearly a week, Dawn's family kept an around-the-clock vigil at her bedside. We had to put on gloves and masks on our faces, and I couldn't handle seeing my sister like that. She was all hooked up to all these different machines, and she just had purple dots all over her, all over her body. The family was startled to learn that Dawn was just one of several children who had come through the hospital recently with the deadly disease. I couldn't believe it. I thought, why isn't anyone else coming forward? Why didn't anyone know what this meningitis and how you know, severe it is, and, and it's a terrible disease. Nearly a week after she was first admitted, doctors told her family Dawn had developed some bleeding in the brain. The news was even worse than they feared. You said, there's nothing you can do. Her kidneys shutting down, her liver shut down. Her brain, she was totally brain dead. There was no way of her coming back to life. Now the McAnguses faced a terrible decision. So they said to me, uh, we'll disconnect all the machines and see if she can function by herself. They agonized and decided to take their daughter off life support. I held on to Don's arm. 
and they disconnected her. And uh, she was dead. Dawn died February 10, 2000 at 4.05 in the afternoon. Fighting her own despair, Deidre McAngus contacted the local television station. She was determined to warn other parents. A deadly bacteria was killing Edmonton's young people. I said, you get a hold of every news person, every reporter that we know in town, and I want a story done. I don't want other people to go through what I've just gone through. Dawn's tragic story made headlines all over the province. Health officials learned that yet another teenager had meningitis. They decided to act immediately. Whenever we have a meningococcal case and there's a death associated with it, it's guaranteed to be of interest to the media and therefore the public becomes concerned. So we felt there should be some action. The health authority decided they had to launch the massive immunization campaign they'd been considering. It was their only chance to stop the outbreak. At a press conference, health officials announced they would start vaccinating 15 to 19 year olds, the highest risk group for this outbreak of meningitis. But even as the orders went out, many worried that they might already be too late. The lethal threat was spreading and fast. Parents in Alberta, Canada were facing their worst nightmare. A deadly disease that preyed on young people and had taken the lives of two teenagers. Public health officials decided they had to act fast to start a mass immunization program, even if they weren't 100% sure it would work. Dr. Jerry Preddy mobilized the agency's resources for the enormous task ahead. We didn't have much time and we had really had to do a large number of people over a very short period of time. So, so we did set up uh, several sites uh, across the region uh, in community locations where people could come. And they, whether they were in school or whether they were working, then this was available to them. 15 to 19 year olds were targeted first because they were most at risk. By mid-February, just six weeks after the outbreak began, the immunization program was underway. Long lines of teenagers streamed into the clinics to begin receiving vaccinations. But to immunize over 50,000 teens, the health department needed a large quantity of the vaccine a much larger supply than they had. It wasn't an easy task to, to get vaccine uh, into the province uh, uh, to vaccinate a large number of individuals. And, and they, they went out of their way to fly the vaccine from across North America. And I believe they even were doing some sourcing out in Europe to get enough vaccine here for us. Regional health officials also set up a hotline to talk with worried parents. Fear had spread through the community even faster than the disease. 15,000 calls came in the first three days alone. Within a week, the health authority had vaccinated 25,000 young men and women. Within eight weeks, more than 50,000, nearly every one of the teens at risk. Now all they could do was wait and hope that their vaccine would work. But other parents were concerned that younger children weren't being protected by the vaccination. Even though the initial uh, high disease rate was in teenagers, uh, there was the potential to spread to younger children. We did then quickly decide that we would announce a campaign for uh, you know, all children under the age of 19. As public pressure mounted, the health authority added two to 14-year-olds to the list. 
Eventually, health officials would inoculate people from ages 20 to 24 as well. This year, it's really dropped off now. I think we're seeing now the full impact of the immunization program because it's 80, uh, 76 percent of people between the ages of 2 and 24 in this province were vaccinated. In the end, two months after the outbreak began, the health authority and the people of Edmonton could breathe a sigh of relief. No new reports of the disease had surfaced. The vaccine had worked. It had stopped an epidemic in its tracks. And each shot would last three to five years. Today, the lethal bacteria has not vanished. It is still present in Edmonton, still a threat to those who have not been vaccinated. But now at least the people there have some protection. Today, Alex Hansen, one of the youngest victims, is back to normal. Surviving meningitis without serious effect, he's growing up happy and healthy. He has made a full recovery. He had one or two little scars, one on his ankle and one on his back from the blood clots, but those have gone away in the last year or so. Matthew Boulding also recovered completely. He's now studying engineering at a local university. His brush with death has given him and his family a new outlook on life. I think we all changed a little bit. Um, and I think Matthew, in my opinion, probably changed because I think when you're 18, you feel really strong and you can do all these things. You can stay out all night, you can work, you can study, you can do everything. You, you just feel invincible. And I think it probably made him feel less invincible. Like it, he could, something can happen to him too. Maybe. Maybe it happened to all of us. Maybe all of us thought that. Maybe it just made us think about how fragile life is. Don's parents, Deidre and Doug McAngus, found strength in tragedy and put it to work. They established the Meningitis Foundation of Alberta. Their own loss allows them to help others as they grieve the death of a child. Having a child die, I certainly um, believe that I've gone through the very worst possible thing that I possibly can go through. So I'm not afraid of absolutely anything anymore. I'll take on any challenge or, or anything in this day and age um, because I honestly believe that I've been through the worst thing that could possibly happen. The Edmonton outbreak of 2000 infected 49 people and claimed three lives. Today, many mysteries remain about the deadly disease. No one has been able to figure out exactly how it arose or how it spread. But this much is sure. In Edmonton, the mass immunization program continues to save lives by keeping a killer at bay.